Aryan Law, namely the series of lectures that we organize. And today I would like to give the floor to our guest lecturer, Mr. Hayashi, who will present his topic devoted to international humanitarian law in the context of the Ukrainian and Russian crisis. Right, thank you very much, Maria, for this introduction. <clears throat> and uh, thank you for uh, taking your time to join us this evening. Uh, my name is Nobuo Hayashi. I come from Japan originally, but uh, currently I'm based uh, in Sweden, where I teach and uh, perform research on international law, including international humanitarian law. And uh, so, I also want to uh, thank the organizers for this opportunity to share my thoughts about IHL. In fact, it's more broadly about international law. It, it, you will see how it develops uh, in connection with what's happening in Ukraine. I propose we uh, spend the next uh, up to uh, one hour or so uh, looking at four main topics. The first topic I want to share with you is, in fact, why I find it so difficult to talk about the war in Ukraine right now. There are a number of uh, very personal reasons why I find it hard to wrap my head around the war in Ukraine. And uh, uh, I have been somewhat reluctant to, to dwell on it in public. The second topic concerns whether we should give Russia a platform to, uh, from which to talk about international law uh, over the war in Ukraine. The third topic concerns whether uh, one could say that international law, including IHL, kind of died in Ukraine, or over the war, died over the war in Ukraine. And the fourth topic is um, that I have in mind is what international law, including IHL, represents for those of, those, those of us in the West uh, amid this war uh, in Ukraine. So what does it mean? What talking about IHL uh, means to us uh, in the West? Now, my concluding observation would be that in the West, we do, uh, as, it, as we should, uh, take international law, including IHL, seriously uh, in view of the war in Ukraine. I was somewhat surprised to come to when I realized that uh, the reason why we do this, why I take international law seriously uh, now, has a distinctly self-regarding uh, twist to it. That is the West being self-regarding about taking international law seriously. and. The self-regarding reasons why the West takes international law seriously in view of what's going on in Ukraine is in one way good news, but in some ways it's not so good news. Uh, I hope I can sort of explain to you why I have come to this view. Now, let me go back to uh, the, the reason why I personally find it very difficult to speak about the war in Ukraine. So, half of my family comes from Budapest. And um, when the 24th of February happened, one of the first things that came to my mind was 1958. And obviously those in the Eastern you know, European region would know what 1958 represents. 
among other dates. And that's when uh, Budapest uh, uh, rose in arms against the, the uh, socialist bloc and, and subsequently experienced this uh, invasion and occupation by the Warsaw Pact forces. Some of uh, some members of my adopt my my family by marriage uh, actually fought to defend Budapest, whereas uh, others uh, struggled to maintain some sort of a resemblance of normal life in the middle of this chaos, violence, and helplessness. So it it's it was almost like a flashback of the so much that I had heard from my relatives uh, of their experience in Budapest that sort of shaped the way I have since uh, observed the Ukrainian events. And I myself come from a Far Eastern country that has yet to account for its own aggression and atrocity uh, atrocities uh, that it committed in, in Asia Pacific more than 75 years ago. And I can very well imagine the how the toxic mix of uh, denialism, resignation, and self-loathing must be crippling a large segment of Russian civil society right now over the war in Ukraine and over many other critical social issues, I'm sure. So there I resonate with the uh, quiet, um, let's say the deafening quiet uh, that we observe through the Western news coverage about how the majority of Russians are reacting or not reacting to the war in Ukraine. Thirdly, I also have close friends and colleagues, both from Russia and Ukraine. And given the enormity of Russian aggression and atrocities, the, let's say, the momentousness, if I can put it like that, and as well as the moral clarity and the sense of purpose singularly belong to Ukraine. There is no question about it. But I still cannot remain indifferent to the alarming, if emotionally understandable, things that I sometimes hear from uh, those in Ukraine concerning uh, international law and IHL. Or can I, nor can I uh, remain indifferent to the uh, sense of isolation and uh, ostracism, if I, if I may uh, uh, put it this way, that those, uh, of those amongst my friends who uh, really uh, oppose the war in Ukraine, they, how they quiet, quietly endure this, this um, uh, uh, hardship, uh, both inside and outside of Russia right now. And all of this, leads to the sense that um, uh, I'm not sure if I am, uh, it's, I feel very inadequate to uh, express my opinions about the war in Ukraine. Uh, having, as I do, a predominantly uh, Western intellectual background and current outlook, although I come from the Far East originally, uh, my post-secondary education is entirely uh, uh, American slash European, Western European, that is. And this, no doubt, has colored the way I perceive the war in Ukraine from a professional point of view. And I possess absolutely no special expertise or uh, uh, special familiarity with the uh, region, that region of the world. So I'm not sure, I, I, it makes me feel as, as if I'm kind of opportunistically and self-servingly uh, profiteering from this event 
for my, uh, let's say, profiling purposes and for my career gain. And that makes me, uh, that doesn't feel right. So these are the reasons why I have found it difficult to engage publicly with the international debates surrounding Ukraine. So I have remained largely quiet. This is a, 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 an unusual occasion, therefore, that uh, I'm sharing my thoughts with you. Now let's move to the second topic I thought I would discuss uh, with you this evening, and that is, should we give Russia any platform from which to speak about international law, given the Ukrainian war? The context in which this topic becomes uh, relevant for me, in fact, there are three specific angles from which to uh, consider this matter. One is uh, in, this, in, in court settings. Another setting is uh, Russia's participation and membership in international organizations. And thirdly, academia. Many of you must have heard how uh, prominent international uh, lawyers uh, familiar faces like Alan Pelé uh, decided to discontinue representing Russia at the International Court of Justice in the recent debate, uh, disputes uh, initiated and instituted by Ukraine. Uh, suddenly, there seems to be some sort of a uh, this, uh, this bang of bad conscience uh, hitting uh, Mr. Pelé and others. Uh, and they could not bring themselves to continue representing Russia's audience. Although, no doubt, uh, decisions like that are uh, uh, weighty ones, and many thoughts must have gone into uh, to them. And I'm not here to judge whether uh, it's a, a sound decision for them. But I was not entirely sure, having, having followed the, the, the way in which these resignations uh, came out, whether deprivileging an argument, let's say, visi uh, the, the visibility of an argument at fora like uh, litigation, international litigation, on account of who's presenting it or who it is being presented for uh, is always a, a good idea. It essentially amounts to uh, unplugging the microphone, not because of what is being said, but because of who is saying it. That is either through the mouthpiece of prominent lawyers like Mr. Pele, or because Russia uh, itself presents its views. I would rather that um, the, uh, we should let arguments coming from Russia undergo vigorous assessments in public and, and stand, let, it, let them stand or fall on their own merits. Uh, in my opinion, bad faith uses of international law, and which clearly uh, many of the things, most of the things that Russia had said are quite clearly bad faith invocations of international law. But I think the better course of action would be to expose them for what they really are, rather than shutting them and unplugging uh, them. When it comes to Russia's membership in international organizations, we know that uh, Russia now has been, it depends on how you put it, I guess, uh, is no longer a member of the Council of Europe. Russia has been expelled from the Human Rights Council at the United Nations. And uh, at least some representatives of Ukraine have publicly questioned whether Russia should have continued the, uh, to, 
occupy the seat that the USSR had left at the Security Council table uh, of the United Nations. The implication might be that uh, because Russia is not a continued continuing state of the USSR, uh, it should apply for membership at the UN and other organizations, just like the former uh, Federal Republic of Yugoslavia was 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 asked to do. I totally understand why there is an urge to question um, this particular aspect of Russia's continuous presence at international organizations. But here too, I'm not entirely sure um, whether expulsion serves the purposes. Clearly, there is the issue of Russia's massive conflict of interest with its participation at certain fora, uh, especially where the forum is meant to debate in human rights issues and so on. But um, the conflict of interest surrounding Russia's participation and participation in the decision-making processes of such bodies is necess not necessarily the same as Russia's membership in such organizations. That's one problem I have. Another problem I have is expulsion perhaps might be the only meaningful punitive action that is available to the organization, but ideally, it's not so much that Russia should be expelled and, and isolated from world bodies like the UN, a more desirable action might very well be for Russia to be uh, disciplined within the structure that exists it's at such organizations. We know how uh, detrimental uh, expulsions and withdrawals and so on from the UN's predecessor, the League of Nations, turn out to be for the League of Nations. Yes, there may be this momentary satisfaction of uh, humiliating and punishing the culpable state, but is it really in the wrong long-term interest of, of, of the international community as such? I am not sure. The third context where I started thinking about whether we should give Russia a platform is in connection with academia. Now, Sweden, for example, has decided to discontinue all academic cooperation and contact with uh, ongoing projects that involves Russian counterparts and uh, to not to initiate any contact with Russian uh, academics for new undertakings. And that goes both for official contacts as well as unofficial contacts. I have a friend, uh, I have a couple of friends uh, who have left Russia. They have been very public and visible in their opposition to the Putin regime and what was going on in Russia. But uh, uh, unfortunately, their voices have no, uh, no, no platform because Russia as, as a whole has been deplatformed, if you will. These people who uh, I might even call uh, people who carries the, carry the cons conscience of Russia, they have lost their uh, uh, platform too. It's almost like collateral damage. And uh, I find that extremely uh, unfortunate. And I'm not sure if, the, if it's the, the, the desirable and smart thing to do in the long run. We may be in the, in the presence of, once again, there is this echo of the last century 
those dissident Soviet scientists who come to the West and speak against uh, what's happening in the Russian, uh, uh, in the Soviet Union. But we are not giving these voices uh, a proper recognition, at least not yet. Similarly, and I'm sure uh, when I say this, uh, some of you would uh, recognize the context in which this has appeared, and that is um, banning Russian participation from international moot court competitions. It's a, uh, an extremely tricky subject, and the subject has played out uh, quite publicly on some competitions like um, the JESA, where I follow most of the developments. And I cannot feel, I cannot help but feel that, um, yes, celebrating the presence of Russia as a state is probably in a, inappropriate. At, uh, uh, given what's going on right now. But uh, banishing international law students who happen to come from Russia uh, on account of the public voices, voicing of support that their universities have uh, given to uh, Russian action in Ukraine I was I was not entirely convinced uh, personally uh, about about that idea, and um, for the same reasons why uh, I cannot see how uh, good it is to uh, shut academic op opponents opponents uh, academics and scholars who oppose. Uh, or who, in fact, I, I, I know of those who have chosen to oppose Russia and have, as a result, fled Russia because it's too, too dangerous for them. As well as I also know people who would otherwise uh, be prepared to speak against Russia, but for the fact that they have, for example, small children uh, to look after and risking arrests and job losses, for example, is not really an op a responsible uh, option for them. So a degree of rec recognizing, acknowledging individuality, even in this enormously uh, uh, heavily emotional moment of wanting to uh, chastise anything that has to do with Russia, I think that's still something that, that is important for us to, to keep in mind. Now I want to move on to the third topic I chose, and that is, did international law die over the war in Ukraine? This topic, unlike the previous one, which arose mostly out of my interaction with uh, Russian colleagues and friends, this topic has arisen uh, in my mind as a result of interacting and observing uh, my Ukrainian acquaintances and friends. So, the question, I think it was a few days into the war, I started noticing on social media how those who had been previously enthusiastic proponents of international law have had dramatically changed their tone when speaking about the subject. Understandably so because of the, the trauma uh, that they were uh, going through, uh, clearly. But even then, the kind of questions that they found themselves asking included, for example, those like 
international law did not stop Russia from committing aggression or from raping, killing, looting, and destroying Ukraine. Only force would do that. The international community stands idly uh, as Ukraine fights for its uh, very survival. The UN's uh, UN Charter's uh, collective security regime has that was supposed to restrain the unruly and protect the vulnerable clearly did not work for Ukraine. Not helping, not specifically helping Ukraine means acting ag actively against Ukraine. One striking example uh, used in this particular con uh, particular setting was the the International Committee of the Red Cross. When rumors started circulating in Ukraine that the IC the ICRC had requested Russia for permission to open a field office in, I think it was called uh, Restov on, on Don. Uh, the, those people who have studied IHL and who have been uh, proponents of ICRC action suddenly started saying things like um, uh, they are in cahoots with Russia. They are uh, uh, buying all sorts of propaganda from uh, Moscow uh, about the, uh, evacuate, the evacuations of Ukrainian residents from Mariupol into Russia. And the shocking, what I found most shocking about the accusations that the ICRC was working with Russia against Ukraine uh, in, in, in that in region was that the, IC, the ICRC was setting up a filtration camp. Now, those who have studied the post Second World War repatriations of Soviet citizens from Western Europe back to the Soviet Union and what happened to these people uh, being further transferred to Siberia, into gulags and so on, they were filtrated at reception camps. Those camps were called filtration camps by uh, uh, Soviet intelligence officials. So to call it filtration camps has this very specific historical connotation, I thought, and to uh, accuse the ICRC of doing that I found that quite shocking. And there was also this uh, persistent view that um, all Russians now, not just cheerleading and non-opposing non Russians, all Russians are responsible for what Russia is doing in Ukraine. Now, if having uh, encountered these statements and sentiments just pouring out of uh, my Russian, uh, my Ukrainian uh, colleagues and friends, in fact, some of them even specifically said that international law is officially dead. The the what it contains is a ton of. I can't say it on uh, uh, on <laughs> on on this particular uh, platform, but uh, which is not even worth the paper that it's printed on. And uh, so the sense of despair and disillusionment is palpable. So what do we do? Do we agree that international law is dead because of what's happening in Ukraine? First of all. In my mind, international law is many things. It is not just one thing, but it is many things. For me, one thing that international law is, is that it is a set, like any other law, 
it is a set of behavioral standards. It actually is meant to guide behavior. And insofar as Russia was bound by international law, including international humanitarian law, and based on what we have, uh, what we know so far, clearly international law has failed in its primary function as uh, behavioral guidance. That is clear. Of course, the fallback position that most of us uh, would immediately think of is that, okay, international law may not have guided Russian behavior in the way it was supposed to, but then where there are breaches of international humanitarian law, then international law envisages accountability. So it has retained the potential for uh, relevance uh, albeit only in its secondary remedial function, if, uh, if if it were to help establish the existence of breaches of international humanitarian law and were to help hold Russia's war criminals, genocidaires and aggressors to account for such breaches, then there is something to be said about international law, I guess, but it has it, it remains to be seen. But there, there are, I think, something, uh, there is something a little more fundamental about what it is that you want law to do, generally. So, can we, can we expect law not just as a set of behavioral guidance and also as some sort of a, a set of sanctions rules, but as counterforce to force, something that actually physically counters force. So when Ukraine was under, uh, under, uh, uh, under aggression, people were screaming, international law, do something, stop Russia from what it's doing right now. And I found it odd. Do we expect law generally to uh, stop criminal behavior in progress? If you are attacked, do you expect law to somehow interrupt it and stop the criminal act that is being committed right now against you? That's not how I see law, at least. Law is there to uh, set the rules, yes. But then having set the rules, unless of course, crime happens in the presence of a police officer, then law might come into, uh, come to your assistance on the spot and disrupt the law-breaking behavior from continuing. But that's usually not how law works. And so, yes, international law did not stop Russia from doing what it is doing. But is that the right question? I'm mean, understandable, though it clearly is, that in moments of desperation, uh, you would want to hang on to anything and everything around you uh, uh, in, to, to come to your aid. But I'm not sure if law is properly placed to do that. And, not, and this is not a unique question to international law. And another fundamental question that is lurking behind uh, uh, this kind of cries uh, of international law's death in Ukraine is 
is law, including international law and IHL, can, in moments of distress, can we, are we capable of approaching international law as anything other than, let's say, uh, reflections of your dire experience and instruments that are there to serve your cause. So if international law doesn't do that, then it is useless. So the UN, crippled as it is, uh, is clearly about uh, securing, ensuring the security of its members. But um, it's not so much that, so there's a crucial difference between the UN being a collective security organization and NATO as a collective self-defense organization. So the UN is set up in a way that is not really meant to function as uh, a group of states that would collectively defend Ukraine. Although something similar happened in Kuwait in 1991, that was, let's say, more of an exception if you take a, a historical view of how the UN has been functioning. Uh, an exceptional flash enabled by the singular moment uh, right after the fall of communism and the emasculated uh, Russian Federation, not really intent on uh, maximizing its veto initiative uh, at the Security Council. That's not how it is now. And more to the point, people who study IHL should know that the ICRC is not there to actually uh, help secure your cause. I spoke to some uh, ICRC officials about the, this strange disinformation campaign that seems to be raging in Ukraine about the ICRC. And one of the uh, accusations coming from Ukraine was that um, uh, the president of the ICRC went to Moscow to meet with Lavrov. And there is the press release uh, conference where he shook hands smiling, uh, the Russian foreign minister. And that is a slap in the face for struggling Ukrainians. When an organization that's supposed to represent and uh, look after all victims of war would speak to a representative of the aggressor state, smiling, shaking hands. The background story is that um, uh, Mauer, President Mauer, and uh, Mr. Lavrov were actually old acquaintances from the 1990s when Lavrov's, Lov, Lavrov was a, a Russian diplomat and when Mao was a Swiss diplomat, both working at the UN. So they are actually old friends. So rather than looking at the photo op that might give perhaps misleading impressions. Those concerned about the work of the RCRC might have bothered to look into the content of the discussion that followed the photo op. And as far as I know, it is not true that the RCRC has requested Russia's permission to open uh, a reception center in uh, Rostov, you know, it, basically, uh, the accusation is that by setting up such reception centers, the ICRC is legitimizing forced uh, deportations of Ukrainians by okay, Russian occupiers. That is not true, according to my sources at the ICRC. So it's really uh, disheartening to see uh, this 
turn of events uh, and taken as true by those who I thought would have known better about international humanitarian law. And the same goes for the uh, temptation to resort to uh, no, the notion of guilt by association when it comes to accusing all Russians uh, of uh, guilty of uh, uh, what Russia is doing. And I've seen exchanges when someone tries to say that uh, not all Russians support uh, the Russian actions in Ukraine, then the retortion, the, the, the rejoinder would be that, but then uh, you are responsible for your government's action and you are the only ones who can change the government's, uh, uh, change the government if you do not approve of it. And that's an interesting uh, line of reasoning coming as it is from, uh, I guess, understandably somehow, from young democracies like Ukraine. So there is this acceptance that the social contract actually works in, in Ukraine, in this Western oriented, vibrant, democratic Ukraine. So if Ukraine does something, then the Ukrainian voters, as it were, yeah, would own up to it. Much as when the United States elects a, a person of questionable integrity to the White House, and when that person does things in the name of the United States, yes, the Americans kind of own it. But I'm not sure if you could say the same of uh, those Russians. And yet the urge is palpable. And I find that understandable emotionally, but nevertheless, um, disheartening. So perhaps international law is dead in the eyes of Ukrainians. And Ukrainians are not the first to say it uh, when people find themselves in distressful situations. I remember how Georgians in 2008 uh, said many of them said something similar because no one came to uh, support Ukraine, uh, Georgia uh, when Russia uh, invaded it. And uh, just one and a half years ago, when uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia fought each other over uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, both Azeris and Armenians uh, expressed dismay at how international law is just not meaningful for them. So the urgency and the immediacy of the situation may prompt people to, to think like this, but um, it's just that, as far as I'm concerned. As far as I'm concerned, it is equally remarkable how the West, for example, continues to take international humanitarian law seriously. And perhaps not, although not perhaps in the way that one might expect. So, so far I have been dwelling on how okay, Russia might invoke international law in bad faith and how we might counter such uses. Is it better to shut them or is it better to expose them for what they are? My preference is to expose them for what they are. Do the Ukrainians think that international law is dead? Many of them seem to think it is and understandable somewhat, but I'm not sure if that is, uh, that explains this international law uh, more broadly. Maybe it's a, a very singular and a specific impression to, uh, uh, to them. That leaves us with 
where I stand right now, that is in places like Sweden, does international law continue to matter? And the answer seems to be a resounding yes. 